Swamp water. Praise 
praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he had done. Y'all have a seat. We're going, the choir's going to sing a song about Thanksgiving. There's going to be an opportunity for you to not only sing, but for some uh, responsive reading. We'll have it on the screen, and I'll turn back to y'all, and y'all will join the choir, and let's uh, celebrate together. All right? Lord of all, to thee we raise. Lord of all, to thee we raise.
September 16, 1620, a small ship sailed with 101 passengers from Plymouth, England to the New World. They sought one thing, freedom to worship. 66 people reached the tip of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Before going ashore, the men on board signed a written document, a document they called the Mayflower Compact. city dwellers in England, the settlers found themselves unprepared for the harsh wilderness. Within a few months, half of the pilgrims had died. Perhaps it seemed their voyage had been in vain, but their quest for a new life had brought them only hardship. Yet, with the help of the natives, the settlers learned to plant and grow crops. By the fall of 1621, they celebrated their first harvest with a feast proclaiming it a day of prayer and thanksgiving to God. is the part that y'all will say with us. And now we as the pilgrims before us celebrate freedom and abundant blessings from our Heavenly Father. So let us join together and bring an offering of praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights. The moon and the stars to govern the night. Who gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the Lord. Let's stand together. Y'all sing with us. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. 
The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done with his blood he has saved me with his power he has raised me to god be the glory for the things he has done just let me live my life let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With His blood He has saved me. With His power He has raised me. To God be the glory for the things He has done. To God be the glory for the things He has done. Y'all have a seat. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. He's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done. Because of what 
Stand with us. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. make your way down. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Sanctuary. 
Thank you, choir musicians, for that beautiful worship this morning. And uh, thanks to all of you yesterday who pulled off the, the great uh, events of yesterday, the bazaar and the flea market or whatever it was. They were selling fleas and ticks and stuff like that up here yesterday. It was coming and going. But uh, no, there was a, a great day yesterday, and uh, a lot of you stayed and helped pick everything up, and, and uh, thank you for doing that and uh, getting things put back in place and getting ready for this morning. And uh, there's a bunch of folks over there now getting the meal warmed up and ready to go so you can eat when the service is over. So I wanted to keep it brief this morning, so I just have 10 points to the sermon outline. Well, yeah, we're not having church tonight, so I got to get both sermons into one, see? And so we'll uh, take it as it comes this morning. All right, we'll dismiss the children right now to Children's Church. Let them go back and uh, have their own little service this morning. And uh, isn't that good to see all the children going back? I remember it wasn't about a year and a half ago. You say go back for children's church, it would have been about three. <laughs> well, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalms this morning. I'm not going to do another commandment this morning. Uh, I think some of y'all about commanded out. But uh, no, for Thanksgiving, we'll be looking at Psalm 30. I'm sorry, 103 this morning. That's a little story I'm reading from 30. But Psalm 103. You know, kind of a basis for this today and for our talk about Thanksgiving and everything that's involved with that, I'm kind of reminded of kind of a base scripture of the of First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, where it challenges us to in everything give thanks. And then it goes on and says after that, in case sometimes we have to wonder what God's will is, it says, for this is the will of God the Father. We know that God desires His people to be thankful because the opposite of being thankful is to either ignore God and be very apathetic about God or to just simply be cranky, contrary, and ungrateful, which comes from a bitter heart, uh, comes from a heart that is very ungrateful because we forget sometimes just how many things we have to be thankful for. Just as a point of introduction this morning, uh, let me just give you a few things that you may, may have that you don't remember to be thankful for. For example, an automatic dishwasher. They make it possible to get out of the kitchen before the family comes in for their after-dinner snacks. Uh, the bathtub, the one place the family allows mom some time to herself. That don't even work sometimes with little ones. For that husband, ladies, who attacks all those little small repair jobs around the house and then usually turns them into big enough jobs where you can call the professionals to do it right. <laughs> For the children who put their things away and clean up after themselves. They are such a joy that you hate to see them go when their parents take them home. Because your kids don't do that, do they? For those teenagers, they give parents an opportunity to learn a second language. For the yard work, oh, we all want to be thankful for the yard work. It's a, it's a relief to deal with the dirt outside the house for a change. <laughs> And on this Thanksgiving Day, we want to be especially thankful for smoke alarms. They let you know when the turkey's done. Uh, for some of us uh, in this time of the year. Uh, so uh, there's some little things that we ought to be thankful for that you're normally not thankful for. And I just remind you of those things uh, this morning. Would you stand and honor the reading of God's holy and inerrant and infallible word? Psalm 103 this morning, beginning in verse 1. Follow along as I read down through verse 14. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 
It doesn't say if you feel good, if everything's perfect in your life. It just says, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems. And some of you say, well, wait a minute, I've got a, I've got a disease that He hadn't healed yet. Well, I'll tell you what, if he doesn't heal it on earth, he'll heal it in heaven. And that's a promise. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your, your youth is renewed like the eagles. And, and the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed and he made known to his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And the Lord's merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. In other words, we've received great mercy from God. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Father, as we read these scriptures today, we're reminded of our frailty we're reminded of how insignificant we really are compared to you. But yet you created us and you've loved us. And even before you created us, you saw our frailty, you saw our sinfulness, and you created a plan of, of redemption for us, a plan of salvation to save us. Oh God, you looked down through time. And God, you knew that we couldn't care for ourselves. You knew that that God man would not be able in all of his imperfections and all of his sin to come into your presence in heaven for eternity and therefore you set out with a plan to cleanse him to prepare him to make him right holy righteous and God you needed something someone who was righteous that would take his place and someone that would take on his filth our filth and would give us his righteousness. And that was Jesus, the one and only. There was no one else. And God, you took our place on the cross, which was what we deserved. Sin demanded it, for the wages of sin is death. And God, you offered us eternal life, forgiveness, fresh start through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God, today, we want to be very thankful for that. Thankful for your patience and your mercy. Teach us to be a thankful people. Not ungrateful. Not bitter. But God thankful. Bless us today, Father, as you speak to us from your holy word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Be seated, please. In Daniel Defoe's book, Robinson Crusoe, you may remember if you've read that story, as many of us did in school, that, that once he found himself shipwrecked on a lonely island, that, that he, he took a sheet of parchment and he made two columns, and, and on, those, in, on that piece of paper he, he wrote good and evil. And he began to weigh his circumstances stranded there on that lonely, barren island. Some of the things that he put in the evil column was things like, okay, I'm stranded. But yet in the good column he could write, but I'm still alive. And then he thought about his food situation, and he said, well, I, I'm alone and I am separated but the ship is right there, and I've got all the food I can eat for a long, long time. I'm not starving. He put that in the good column. He didn't have a lot of clothes, but he was thankful that as he put his lack of clothing as an evil, maybe, he thought about the fact that it was a warm climate, and he didn't need a lot of clothes. 
So he was thankful, and he put that in the good column. He looked around him, and he said, I, Well, I don't have a lot of defenses if there's wild beasts or danger. I, I don't have a lot of ways to defend myself. And he put that in the evil column. But then after searching the island, he found that there were no wild beasts there on the island. And he put that in the good column, that it was a safe place. I guess I'm saying that, that if we look around us, and if we try hard enough, most of us probably have more things we could put in the good column than we have that would go in the evil column. We have been blessed beyond measure. Once he thought about his condition, he knew that he needed to be thankful for the good things that he was experiencing, was Robinson Crusoe. Your life may feel a bit shipwrecked. You may have fallen upon some rocky ground. You may have found yourself facing some hard times but I'm sure if you'll look around very much, you'll find someone who will swap places with you. I remember reading a story about someone who was sitting around complaining about their sore feet until they saw someone wheel by in a wheelchair that had no feet. I remember reading about someone who complained about their physical conditions and then they read a story about someone who was a lot worse than them and then someone else who had died. We could look around today as we talked about last week, reducing our debt and getting rid of our debt here at the church. And, you know, we could look at our debt as a real ugly thing, as a real evil thing. But I'll tell you what, if we want to look at the good side of that, we could say, but we've got beautiful facilities and a beautiful campus today. So we've got a lot to be thankful for. And so we look at our lives today, and there's so much that we, if we will have the right perspective, can be very positive and very optimistic about life. Because with God, all things are possible. When I look at the world today and the hardships of the world, if you don't know Christ, the Bible even says you're of mo all men most miserable. And your life is not filled with much hope if you don't know Christ. But God's here today to offer you hope. God's here today to offer you an optimistic view of life. God's here today to offer you His Son who will never leave you and will never forsake you. God's here today to offer you a family of God. People who will love you and who will care about you. No matter who you are and no matter what you've been through, they'll love you and they'll be there for you. So today as we look at this, and we've read several of these verses, I could have read the whole chapter this morning, because it is so full of praise and thanksgiving as the psalmist David wrote, who by the way had had his own share of issues and hardships that he had gone through, some of them he brought on himself, but yet he had a lot of reasons to bless the Lord. I would venture to say you do too. I would venture to say that you and I have a lot of reasons to just be thankful, and not only during this Thanksgiving season, but year-round. Even if it's clean air, some places don't have that. Clean water, some places don't have that. A roof. Well, some of you say, we don't have very clean water, but compared to some people you do, well, some days it's good. But uh, uh, how about a house to sleep in and a bed to sleep in and clothes to wear and usually can find something to eat. It may not be what you wanted right then, but you'll usually find something. Let's list this morning some of these things that, that the psalmist here points out in these verses this morning. And I'm going to quickly go through these and try to finish these this morning. The first one we see in verse 1, David thanks the Lord for his sovereignty. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
When he says, bless the Lord, he is saying, I want to thank God for everything he's done. I want to thank God for all that is within me. What David sees here is that God has been good to him. And if we will all count our blessings, we'll find that God's been good to us. If you could be here this morning, God's been good to you. If you even had the opportunity to be here, if you were born in America, God's been good to you. You were born in a land of opportunity. And even in the hard times, in the tough times we face in this life, in the confusing times, if you'll be honest and you'll look, you'll still be able to say, but yet God has been good to me in so many ways. God never promised you everything would be easy. He never promised you a bed of roses. He never promised you if you get saved, you won't have any more problems in your life. But what God did promise you is a home in heaven one day. For there will be no more problems and no more tears and no more sorrow. What he promised you here is he'd never leave you. He'd never forsake you. And what he promised you here is forgiveness. And we're going to see a lot of these this morning as the psalmist talked about these in his text this morning. Even those first pilgrims here in our land, uh, uh, they'd been through the hard times as we showed you in the slides and the video this morning. And they'd been through a lot of hard things they faced, but they still found time to thank the Lord. Even though they had experienced death and sickness and loss of friends and loved ones and a rough trip here, they found a lot to be thankful for. I'm thankful for the sovereignty of God. I'm thankful that that God knows all things and can do all things and will never turn his back on me. I am thankful for that God is what the psalmist is saying uh, here in verse 1. If you skip down to verse 3, because the second one uh, basically repeats some of that, and uh, about that now he's going to list a lot of those blessings, it says in verse 2. In verse 3, he begins to list more of them, his salvation. You ought to thank God this morning if you're saved, because you didn't deserve to be saved. I didn't deserve to be saved. Out of God's grace and His mercy, He reached out to you and offered you forgiveness. He offered you a fresh start with God. His wonderful redemption, the Bible teaches us, is the most important thing that you'll ever have in your life. Sometimes people say, getting married is the most important decision you'll ever make. I beg to differ. The most important decision you'll ever make is the decision to accept Jesus Christ or the decision to reject Him. That's the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life because it's the only one that deals with eternity. And I'm going to tell you, if you accept Jesus, He'll change your life. He will totally, radically transform your life, give you new hopes, new dreams, new priorities for life. The second thing, we, the third thing we see here is strength. In the last part of verse 3, he who heals all your diseases. He is the God uh, who gives us strength and healing. The one who renews our body. I don't understand the healing power of the body. God's creation. How that you can cut your arm and it will heal itself. That's a God thing. Amen. I know there's a medical explanation for it. I know there's a scientific explanation. But who wrote those scientific laws? Who created those laws of medicine? Who, who determined that the body, the, the blood particles would come together and, and they would join and they would rebuild that flesh and the, the white blood vessels would fight disease and, and sickness and infection and, and, and defeat that enemy of the body's healing process? Who created that but God himself? We take that for granted. But it is God who is our strength. It is God who is our healer, and it is God who will one day permanently heal us. He will permanently heal us in a place called heaven where there will be no more tears and no more sorrow. Thank God for your health. I promise you, if you're going through some hard times, it could be worse. And there are people that, uh, that it is worse even now. The fourth thing. Thank God for the fact that he separated us from the world. Look what it says in verse 4. Who redeems you from destruction. When I say separation here, I mean that God called you out of the world. Do you know where you were before you got saved? 
You are on a road to destruction, the Bible says. Did you know that? Did you know the Bible says that there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end of that way is the way of destruction, the way of death? Did you know that? The Bible says without Christ you're headed toward hell. You're headed toward a place of destruction. And it is God who separated you from the masses, who separated you from that crowd that was headed toward destruction. And it was God who separated you to himself. That means he called you out. He pulled you out of that crowd. He, he beckoned to you and offered you salvation. And you responded and said, yes, Lord. I'm here to tell you my God loves the world. So much so that he sent his only begotten son to die for the world. But I'm here to tell you, you must say yes to God. He's not just going to force you to come to him. Oh, there's that movement of Calvinism today which just says that basically God's just going to pick who can be saved and who can't be saved and he's just going to pull people to himself and you don't even have the right to say no. I'm here to tell you what kind of love would that be if you force somebody to love you. That's not love. God calls. God desires to save. But I'm here to tell you, you're going to have the final say so, my friend. And if you die and go to hell, it's not God's fault. It's because you said no to God. If you're here this morning, you'll never have an excuse the rest of your life. Because this morning, God wants you to know that He loves you. And God's doing everything. He's moving heaven and earth to get you to come to Him, to be saved, to have your sins forgiven, to, be a, to become a thankful person. And this morning, you can either say yes, or you can say no. And never again will you have an excuse when you stand before God and say, well, I didn't know, or I didn't have enough chances, or if I had one more chance, I'm here to tell you this morning, God's giving you a chance today to be saved. And you can say yes, or you can say no. But it is God who's willing to separate you from the masses. Do you hear what I'm saying? The majority of the world is going to hell. You say, well, why do you say that? You don't know, preacher. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says there's two paths, there's two roads. And the road to hell, which is paved with good intentions. Well, I meant to. I thought about it. You know, the road to hell has, is a broad road. It says it's got a big, wide gate. And most of the people, the Bible says, go that way. And then there's a narrow gate and there's a narrow road. And, and it says, that, and why is it so narrow? Because it's a gate that goes through Jesus Christ. It's, there's only one way to be saved. It can't be by this way and that way and every other way in the world or being good enough or, or having this religion or that religion. There's just this narrow road says you're going to trust, you're going to understand you're a sinner and you're going to ask God to forgive your sins and you're going to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and be the Lord, the Savior, and the Master of your life. That's the only way. Hello? Are you with me? That's a narrow gate because that's the way God said it's going to be done. You don't determine how you're going to get saved. God determines how you're going to be saved. And you've got to be willing to become a follower of Jesus Christ and let Him be the Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible says that's why you go down that narrow gate, but few find it. The, the minority finds it. So I'm asking you this morning to come to Christ, but I'm also asking you to join the minority this morning. We all like to be in the majority, don't we? We all like to put off peer pressure and be in the majority, but I'm telling you this morning, when God calls you, He calls you to be in the minority. He calls you to be the fish that's swimming upstream when everybody else is going downstream. When it's easier to go along with the crowd. When it's easier to attend all the parties and do everything everybody else is doing. God's calling you to be in the minority. God's calling you to be different. He's calling you to be holy, the Bible says. Not holy because you're good enough. You're holy because you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And He's changed you. And He has made you something you were not. He says you were some things, but now you are something different. Separation. Be thankful that God separated you because you couldn't separate yourself. He put you in His flock. Number five, his sympathy. I'm thankful today. The psalmist was thankful today that he was a God of sympathy. Look at the end of verse 4. It says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Aren't you glad that God is a God who is has filled with loving kindness? Aren't you glad that it was God who first loved you? If he hadn't first loved you, he wouldn't have first sent his son Jesus Christ to the cross for you. 
He loved you, the Bible says, when you and I were unlovely. <laughs> Hello? Are you with me this morning? And He had mercy for you when you didn't deserve it. So what I'm saying to you this morning is, I am thankful today for the sympathy of my God. That He cared for me when I didn't care for Him. And He called me and gave me an opportunity to be saved. I'm so glad. He, he, you know, he could have looked at me. He could have been unsympathetic like most of us are. Hello? Are you with me? Maybe I should have just been talking about me. Well, that knucklehead, he deserved what he got. You know? I see somebody act like a knucklehead. Y'all ever see anybody act like a knucklehead? And I see somebody act like a knucklehead, and I say, well, that knucklehead got what he deserved. Well, he should have known what was coming. I, I don't have any sympathy for him. He, he treated me bad. I treat him bad. I, I don't have sympathy for him. I'm so glad that when I, treated, when I treated God bad, God didn't have the attitude we have sometimes. Some of you are glad God had sympathy with you. I, I got saved when I was just a kid. I was eight years old. God didn't save me out of Skid Row. God didn't save me out of a drug addiction. God didn't save me out of alcoholism. God didn't save me out of a broken family. God didn't save me out of physical abuse. God didn't save me. I'm going to tell you what God did for me. God saved me from a bunch of stuff. He saved me from having to go through a lot of stuff. But some of you here, God saved you out of a bunch of stuff, didn't he? If God saved you out of a bunch of stuff, let me see your hand this morning. You see, God had real sympathy for y'all. He had sympathy for me too, but I, it works better with my illustration if I can say y'all. Because some of y'all, I wouldn't have had sympathy for. Hello? Some of y'all was ugly, mean, drug addicts, alcoholics, womanizers, fighting in the streets and carousing. Now y'all quit pointing fingers. God had sympathy for you. And aren't you glad he did? That's my God. I'm going to tell you, you ought to wake up every morning thankful that God loved you because you were unlovely. I was a kid. I, 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 didn't, I didn't get saved out of all that junk. I hear people sometimes say, well, I'm like you, preacher. I, I don't have much testimony. I was just a kid and I got saved. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I used to say that. I used to say, well, I don't have much to talk about. I, I, I got saved as a child. I don't have much to testify about. Oh, I'm, I'm almost jealous of them people that was murderers and thugs and beat people up and drug addicts. I really, you know, I really wish I'd been a thug. I could have really good testimony. But you know what I learned as I got older? I'd rather have my testimony and your testimony. Amen. Amen? I want every child to get saved. I want every little one to get saved because I want God to save them from some stuff. And not have to save them out of some stuff. But I am tickled to death that God saved you out of some stuff. I am tickled to death that it's not too late for God to save you. So I'm tickled to death today that God has sympathy on us. Whether you're a child or whether you're 70, God will still save you today. Number six, because of God's supply. Boy, our time is gone. I, don't, I know I didn't preach that long. Let me do these last ones real quick, because you'll see them in these verses. I'm thankful for God's supply. Verse 5, he's thankful. He satisfies your mouth with good things, that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God's just, God has supplied some blessed stuff, is not he? For your, if you didn't have to walk to church this morning, you ought to be thankful this morning. Amen? I look at those old days when they had to get in the horse and buggies and They'd ride. One of the reasons they'd, they'd stay at church so long because they'd, they'd have church and they'd all stay together and eat and they'd have church again because they had a 
two-hour horse buggy ride back home. They didn't want to have to turn around and come back. I'm so thankful we could get in the car and drive this morning and didn't have to do that. That's what the psalmist is saying here. In verse 6, we see, thankful for his shield, how God has protected me. The Lord executes righteousness, his justice for all who are oppressed. God shields us. God cares for us. God watches out for us. God is a God who will make sure that his people, even though we may go through hard times, the devil has a limit on what he can do in our lives, folks. I'm here to tell you the devil can't do nothing to me unless God allows him to do it. I'm here to tell you all God's got to do is say, Hey, devil, stop it. Sit down. Shut up. I'm in charge of him. Leave him alone. Some of you say, Well, why does he not tell him that on me sometimes? Because sometimes we don't sit down and shut up. Because sometimes we off over here when we ought to be over here and this is God's will and we over here doing what we ought not be doing and we wonder why God lets bad stuff happen to us. And we're unrepentant and we, we living in sin and disobeying God and we're wondering why we're having some of the problems we have. We kick God out of school and wonder where God was at when there was a school shooting. Well, you told God to stay home. You see, we, we kick God out of our life sometimes. But God is my shield. And if God allows me to go through some things, if God allows me to go through some tough times, which sometimes he does, he's not going to override all the laws of nature. He's established the laws of nature. He will one day in a place called heaven. But here on this earth, God's going to let us go through some things. Why? The devil wants to use them to destroy your faith, but God wants to use them to build your faith. God wants us to be reminded that we need him. Faith is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the, more it'll, the stronger it'll get. God wants to, wants to remind us that we need Him every day. Trust Him. Pray and seek His face. Number eight, I thank Him for His strategy. Look at verse seven. He made known His ways to Moses. He made known those ways and His acts to the children of God. You know, the Bible tells us that God's not going to do anything. He doesn't let His prophets know about that. He doesn't let His preachers, His people know about that. God is a God who lets you know His ways. For example, His ways is that straight and narrow gate and that one way of salvation. God lets you know that. God's not afraid to tell you that. Jesus made that real clear to us. What are else are the ways of God? Well, you walk off out there in rebellion, you walk outside of God's protection, you may, you may find yourself under the judgment. But the Bible tells us to, to lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge God, to trust God, and He shall guide our path. What are God's ways? Well, sometimes God's ways are forgiveness. Isn't it amazing sometimes God wants, we want God to bless us, but yet we're not willing to be obedient to God. We're not willing to forgive somebody. You know, we think we can live in rebellion to God and not obey God, and yet we want God to do everything for us, but we're not willing to do stuff for God. God says, there's somebody you need to go to, and you need to forgive that person. Well, God, I'm not going to do that, but I want you to keep forgiving me, God. Well, it don't work that way. That's not God's ways. God says, you want to be forgiven? You want to be blessed? Do what I tell you to do. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. How long has it been? I've been asking you this question the last few weeks. I want to ask it again. How long has it been since you trusted God? Since you had to say, God, I'm doing this. I don't know exactly how it's going to happen, God, but I'm just going to trust you. I've been afraid to do it. I've been, I've been not trusting you, but God... I, whether it's go to somebody and forgive them, whether it's give something. Maybe God's telling you to give something to somebody to help somebody financially. Maybe he's telling you to start tithing. Whatever God may be telling you to do. How long has it been since you did something you had to just trust God and do it? Maybe God wanted you to witness somebody and you're sitting around saying, I, I can't do that. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And God said, yes, you can. Trust me. Trust me. You see, God honors trust. God honors those times when we trust Him. So that's His strategy. God's going to make known His ways. And I believe this. And do you believe this? Do you believe that when, when something's happening, when something's going on in my life, I believe this. I don't understand why certain things happen at certain times, but I do believe this. I do believe it's for my good when God lets something happen in my life. 
and it's for God's glory. When things happen in my life, I believe it's for my good and for God's glory. What was the theme kind of of our verse this morning? About even in, in all things, give thanks. What about the bad things? In all those things, give thanks. I don't understand what God's doing sometimes when he lets bad things happen in my life. But in all things, give thanks. Why? Because I believe whatever it is, God's promise in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to God's purpose. So I believe that whatever I'm going through, God can bring good out of that and he can glorify himself in it if I'll just be what God wants me to be in it. Do it the way God wants you to do it and you'll be blessed. Number nine, his slow wrath. Verses eight and nine. Boy, aren't you glad God's a God of slow wrath? He's slow to anger. I won't take much time on that. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's bounding in mercy. He'll not always strive with us. He will not keep his anger forever. There are times God gets angry. You know, the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. What do you think makes God angry at us? One of the things that makes God the angriest is when we when we neglect his son, Jesus Christ. When we say, you know, I gave my son. I, I remember many of you probably heard the story about the man who operated the drawbridge, and I'll close with this. I'll, I'll give you that last one. But the, and the last one is his satisfaction. I, I serve a God who is so full of satis, who, who satisfies me. He says there in verse 10, he dealt with us according to our sins. He punished us according to our, he, nor, nor punished us according to our iniquity. God, I am thankful because of his satisfaction. The Bible says in that verse, he'll take verse 12, and I'm going to come back and share that story with you. He says, he'll take my sins and he'll cast them as far as the east is from the west. He'll remove our transgressions from us. You always heard that, didn't you? He'd cast your sins in his bag in the depths of the sea as far as the east is from the west. And if you look at a map, you don't really know where the east starts and the west starts. and the, You don't even know. It just keeps going around and around. Where's the east stop and the west start? And it just, there's no distance there. It just goes on and on. But God, I am thankful that, that I can get to that place, that God puts me in that place, that, that he can look at me and say, I'm satisfied. The Bible calls it in Ephesians chapter 1, accepted. He makes me accepted in Christ. I'm so glad I can get to that place that God can be satisfied with my life because I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Back to that story, and we close. Man owned a, or ran a, a drawbridge that they had. He worked in that little house on the bridge, and and every every time a big ship came through, they had to lift the bridge up. Had all the big mechanical gears and stuff down there that lifted the bridge up, and it's kind of a dangerous place out there. That's why he has a little house to stay safe. And and the story is that he he was he was in the in a little booth one day, and he had, had had to take his little boy to work with him that day. And some way or another in the process, they'd been outside doing something. He had to run to the bridge and house and raise the bridge. And, and as the, the boat went under, as he started to let the bridge down, I'm trying to make sure I get the story just right. No, he had to let the bridge up. Not down, as he had to let the bridge up. And he knew, he turned around and looked, and his little boy was gone. And he knew if he didn't let it up, there was going to be a major collision. The boat was going to, the big ship was going to hit the bridge, and there was going to be some major death and everything else because there were still some cars parked on the bridge waiting. And, and uh, so in that process, he said, he looked, and he saw his little boy was hung in the gears down there where the, where the bridge raises. And he had to make a quick decision. Do I let the bridge up? He said, because if I do, his brother Hugh can probably tell us what it's like to get caught in, a, in the gears. He said, but if I let the bridge up, my little boy is going to be killed. And he had to make a quick decision. And he, to make a long story short, he did. He went ahead and he let the bridge up. And his little boy was killed. But he saved the life of many others that day 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine that, Daddy? If as he looked at those people in those cars, as he eventually let the bridge back down and the people drove by, can you imagine those people coming by him, not knowing what's happened, not knowing that his little boy got caught in the gears of the bridge and, and he was just crushed and killed? Can you imagine as those cars went by and maybe as that ship went by and as this man standing on the bridge and he's watching people get their lives back to normal and those people kind of come by him and you know how people act sometimes. You know, they're going to throw you the middle finger or they're going to cuss you or they're going to laugh. And, and here you just gave your son's life for their life, to save their life. And they're giving you the middle finger. They're drinking beer and they're laughing and they're partying and having a good time, not realizing the price you just paid for their life. How many of you admit I'd be pretty angry? I'd be pretty angry. You ever think that's sometimes how God feels? When he realizes he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, and people kind of give God the middle finger. They go out and party and laugh and live it up and say, I don't care what God thinks. The Bible says it would be a fearful hand fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. A lot of folks are going to die with their middle finger stuck up at God. They did their own thing. They didn't care what God thought. And I'm going to tell you, if you die without Christ, that's what you've done. You just stuck your middle finger up at God and said, not for me. I don't care what you think, God. The Bible says that'll be a fearful day for you. To stand before God and give account of your life, the decisions you've made. But I want to tell you, if you make the right decision, if you, you give your life to Jesus Christ, and, and I don't mean you just say a little magic prayer. Sometimes we think, I just say a little magic prayer, I'll be okay. Or if I get wet in the baptistry, I'll be okay. Or if I become a Baptist, I'll be okay. Or if I get my name on church roll, I'll be okay. I'm here to tell you, my friend, it's different than that. It's when you make a life-changing following decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ and let Him be the Lord of your life. Don't ever think being a Baptist is going to get you to heaven. Don't ever think being a part of any church is automatic going to get you into heaven. Don't think the baptistry waters will get you to heaven. Don't think your name on a church roll is going to get you to heaven. If your heart hadn't changed. You see, the heart's got to change. As wicked as we are, as wrong as we are, and, and we're still human, and we still got a long ways to go, but I'm going to tell you my heart's desire, my heart's desire is to be more like Jesus. I tell you, I still got a long ways to go. But that's my desire. My desire is a year from now to be more like Jesus than I am now. Is that your desire? Would you bow with me as our musicians come? As we prepare for an invitation, I'm going to be here in the front. I'm going to be here in the front and we're talking about a thankful heart this morning. You know what a thankful heart is? A thankful heart is a saved heart. A thankful heart's a redeemed heart. A thankful heart is a heart that follows Jesus. A thankful heart is somebody who's not bitter and evil and still following the desires of the world, but a thankful heart is one that says, Oh, God. I know I'm not where I am because of me. I'm here because of you, God. I'm here to thank you, and I'm here to acknowledge that, God, you put breath in my lungs, and, God, you put food on my table, and, God, you give me the brains to go out and have a job, and, God, you, you have blessed me in so many ways, and, God, one day I'm going to get to go to heaven. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you. Even through my struggles, God, thank you. For being good to me. 
That's a saved person. Who knows that? If you're not saved this morning, why don't you come this morning and receive a thankful heart? Why don't you come this morning and let Christ come into your life and save you? The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, the children of God. Oh, would you come this morning and receive him? Let him get on the throne of your heart and take charge. Would you come this morning and do that? Oh, my friend, God loves you. Has a wonderful plan for your life. Would you come? Let's stand together. Father, we commit this invitation into your hands. God, it's you alone that saves. It's you alone that gives us a reason to be optimistic. And God, that's you alone that calls this morning. And I don't care what we've done, Lord. God, this morning you're calling people to come. Come to your love. Come to your forgiveness. Come this morning and say yes to Jesus. Oh, God. Speak today. Lord, there may be people here this morning who are still trying to make that decision of whether or not they're going to reach out and take your hand or God, or whether they're going to shake their fist at you. God, help people make a decision this morning, yes or no. To follow you or to forsake you. God, help them to step out this morning, take a step of faith and come and take me by the hand, Lord, and say, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you need to be saved this morning, just come to me. You don't know what all to say. Just come say, I want Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Just come this morning. There'll be a deacon here at the front. If you need somebody to pray with you, maybe you need to come to this altar and just start praying. Pray for yourself. Pray for somebody. Whatever you need to do this morning. You come on. Let God have his way right now as we sing. Weak and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. Raise your hands for love is passing by. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Now your burden's lifted and carried far away. Precious blood has washed away the stain. Sing for Jesus, sing for Jesus, sing for Jesus. Like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to crawl. Remember when you walk, sometimes you fall. Fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus. Sometimes the way seems lonely, steeped and filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus and live. going to go for another minute or so. Have you been obedient to God this morning? Have you got a thankful heart? Maybe a Christian this morning that you become hardened and your heart's not thankful. You've forgotten just how blessed you are. 
I'm here to tell you, folks, if you're going to tell somebody else about Jesus, if you and I are going to be an example, the greatest example we can be is to have a thankful heart. Maybe you need to ask God to help you have a thankful heart. Amen. Thank y'all for being here this morning in the house of the Lord. Um, let me just remind you of some things coming up on our calendar before we dismiss to go eat this morning and have our blessing. Uh, just coming up, uh, this is obviously, we don't have services tonight. I remind you that our Wednesday night. No activities here this week. Uh, the office will be open for the next couple of days if you need to get by the office. But um, coming up on the 3rd, uh, on December the 3rd, that morning we'll have the Hanging of the Green and our Christmas, our adult Christmas musical two weeks from today. Then that night we're going to have an ordination service for Brother Hugh. Uh, going to ordain him. The ordaining council will be at 5 for those of you who are ordained men. Uh, and then the, the ordination will be at 6. Uh, then a week and a half later on that, the 13th, uh, we'll have the children's musical that Wednesday night. And then on the 17th, one of the things I want you to know on the 17th, well, on the, well, I won't worry about the mission speaker on the 10th, but on the 17th, we're going to have a banquet. We're going to have steak and shrimp that night. And I think we have that planned at 5 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock, but that's going to be the night you're going to turn in your commitment cards to the, to the campaign, as we, I gave you last week. If you don't have one, want to come get one, just gave them to you to start praying about it. What is your rock? What can you throw at the old giant? And uh, we're just praying that God's going to pay our debt off over the next three years. That God's going to do it His way, however He wants to do that. And uh, what part we can be with that. But on that night, we're going to turn that in. That night, we were going to do something today, but we've had to put it off to that. We're getting ready to dedicate the playground out here to Miss Gloria Albritton. And we're having the sign made. We thought we were going to be able to do it right now. We were going to go outside and do that. But the sign's not quite ready, so we're going to put that off till that, till that day, the 17th, when we come up here. And what we're going to do is right prior to everything starting at 5 that evening, we're going to get outside and have that dedication service uh, outside for Miss Gloria uh, at the playground. So that'll be on the 17th, uh, a month from now. And so I uh, look forward to that day. A lot going on. Let's have our closing prayer, and it'll be a prayer of thanksgiving for the food and everything. And if you're stay, please stay today and eat with us. We got more. We got enough food over there. We'll probably feed twice as many people. But you stay and eat with us. Go right through these doors and right back to the fellowship hall. You go through and fix your plates. They got tables in both fellowship halls, and you go through there and let us stay and let us get to know you today. Okay. And uh, thank you for coming. Don't forget your children. You brought your children. Take them home. We don't want them. <laughs> I've raised mine already. Please go get your children. <laughs> All right. Let's close in prayer and uh, with thankful hearts. Oh, God, we are so thankful today. How good it is to be in your house, Lord, and to be reminded just how thankful. The psalmist was so thankful, and God... To, Paul, and writing to the church at Thessalonica, said we ought to always be thankful, God. And as we stop and count our blessings as believers, God, we have so much to be thankful for. So, God, today we say thank you for loving us. We say thank you for the hope of heaven. We say thank you that you are our God who never leaves us or forsakes us. And we say thank you that you're the God who can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. So, Father, thank you for this church the brothers and sisters in Christ that we have. Thank you for the food that's on the table over there today and the fellowship that we'll know. Take us home. Help us enjoy this week with our families and being thankful, Father, and showing our thankfulness. Bless our time together here today. Bless those who have prepared the meals, those who God will be cleaning up today and May you be honored by our thoughts in our hearts this week is our prayer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right.